Welcome to the Arc Junkies podcast, everyone. Joining me this week is Kevin Waugh out of Regina, Canada. Kevin is a welder, fabricator, metal artist, and shop foreman. I've been following Kevin on Instagram for years and finally got to meet him in person at Canweld back in October. In this episode, we chat about some fabrication tricks, production welding, safety, and much more. We'll get right into the episode after a quick word from our supporters. Today's episode of the Arc Junkies podcast is brought to you by Outlaw Leather. Are you a welding enthusiast or a tradesperson in need of top-notch leather welding gear and accessories? Of course you are. You're listening to the Arc Junkies podcast. Look no further than Outlaw Leather. Outlaw specializes in crafting custom leather welding hoods, arm pads, bolt bags, sleever bars, tool belts, and a wide range of custom welding accessories. Each piece is handcrafted with precision and designed to withstand the toughest conditions. But that's not all. Outlaw Leather also stocks essential PPE for welding, ensuring you stay safe on the job. Plus, they have a selection of quality hand tools that you can trust. Visit outlawleather.com today to explore their extensive range of products. Whether you're a professional welder or a DIY enthusiast, Outlaw Leather has you covered. And the best part is, as a listener of the Arc Junkies podcast, you can use promo code ARCJUNKIES in the discount box at checkout to get an exclusive 15% discount on all in-stock handmade leather goods. Outlaw Leather, elevate your welding game today. We're also brought to you by CK Worldwide, the standard in TIG welding. They make top-notch TIG torches and consumables. CK is the only brand I trust at my school and at home for all my side work and personal projects. I just finished up a bunch of repairs on some stainless steel restaurant pieces. Since these are repairs and not fabrication, I have to fit into some tight spots and still be able to get good gas shielding and torch angles. And with the gas saver kit and the Flex Lock 360 torch from CK Worldwide, neither issue is a problem. I'm able to hit all the awkward angles and still get great gas coverage. I've been using this specific torch now for over two years, and it's been able to handle every task that I throw in front of it. And the best part is, you can get a Flex Lock 360 in water-cooled or gas-cooled, so you can take it with you on site and out in the field. Check out the Flex Lock 360 and all the great innovations CK has at ckworldwide.com. CK Worldwide, the standard in TIG welding. We're also brought to you by Rock Mount Research and Alloys the go-to name for maintenance welding in the most demanding environments. Today, I want to tell you about their Tartan AAA, a true game changer. With an incredible 86,000 pounds of tensile strength and 28% elongation, it's the ultimate choice for durability. The Tartan AAA features a micro-dense, moisture-resistant coating. This rod can handle even the toughest conditions, from tight spots to dirty, contaminated steels. And the Tartan AAA's triple deoxidized deposits ensure low weld spatter with its excellent out-of-position capability guaranteeing successful repairs even in the trickiest spot. But that's not all. Experience ultimate puddle visibility and effortless vertical down runs, making pass-on-pass over slag a breeze. Ideal for low to medium alloy steels, Tartan AAA is your answer when the going gets tough. And right now, you can get a free one-pound tube of Tartan AAA when you spend $250 or more at rockmountwelding.com when you use code word AJP in the discount box at checkout. Don't settle for less. Get the job done right the first time, every time, with Rockmount. We're also brought to you by Fronius USA. Fronius is thrilled to announce two new products to unleash your welding potential. First up is the Fronius Dual Wire Feeder. The new WF25i gives welders the freedom to have two torches ready to go, each with different wire types, sizes, different welding parameters, and easily switchable at the touch of a button. No need to change wire spools or consumables between applications. Get precision wire feeding and save time without adding complexity to your day. Next is the new mobile fume extraction system, Exento. The Exento comes in a high vac and a low vac version to fit your specific welding needs. The low vac system includes a flexible extraction arm with 360 degree rotation and a flow optimized hood for exceptional fume capture rate. The high vac system combines perfectly with the Exento torch kits to remove more than 99.9% captured fume particles at the arc to provide excellent extraction in a compact unit. Check out FroniusUSA.com for more details. All right, you know what time it is. Fire up your machine, drop your hood, and turn me up five. Thank you for downloading show number 311 of the Art Junkies Podcast. You're listening to the Art Junkies Podcast. Helping you make every weld better than your last with each episode. And now your host, Jason Becker.
All right, Kevin Waugh, bienvenue sur le podcast des Art Junkies. <laughs> Merci beaucoup. Hey, ça, ça c'était bien fait. It was very well done. Very well thank done. Thank you, thank you. I've been practicing all week. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I didn't realize that you spoke French until we got up there to uh, Canwell. Yeah, no, I was born and raised in Quebec. I didn't learn English until I was eight. Um, but it's funny, though, because I've lived in English longer than I've lived in French. Uh, I learned to read and write my French in a French immersion school in British Columbia. Um, so my dad was RCMP. That's why we moved around so much. But yeah, um, when I got to Canwell, that was kind of my, my uh, kind of a, a test, a, a little um, trying out period for myself to kind of get right back into French and try to help uh, the CWB Association with translating what was going on. I'm just glad that uh, Max messed your name up, so I didn't have to. <laughs> as long as like, as long as people try, that's the big thing, right? I still, whenever I introduce myself, I still say my name in French. That's that is the name. It it is French. It's Roi. Quoi? You got to clear your throat a little right. bit. Uh, ex- yeah, yeah. Quoi, it's, it's close. It's close. As long as you try, that's the big. Thing. Yeah, I always thought it was Kevin Roy. It's in in uh, English speaking land. It can be, but I still I still uh, I am a French Canadian, a proud French Canadian. Uh, even though I haven't lived there for a while, I'll always be French Canadian. And you you've lived up there your entire life, right? Yeah, in Canada, I've lived up there. Um, you know, I, I've lived in a few towns in Quebec. I've lived in New Brunswick, British Columbia, uh, and now I'm in Regina, Saskatchewan. You're you're up there with uh, Max. Is like right up in that area, right? We live in the same town, yes, oh, no and I call it, it's a city, but it's it's definitely a small town, Saskatchewan. Um, takes 15 minutes to get anywhere, whatever. We have over 250,000 people here. But yes, Max and I uh, live at the opposite end of the town, and um, it's kind of it's kind of fun. It's kind of cool. So 15 minutes away, you guys hang out quite a bit? Uh, not really. I'm, I'm super busy. He's super busy. Uh, definitely have to schedule the meetups. Uh, we were, we were talking, um, about filming some more videos for the CWB association and literally like we're texting, are you good Monday? No. Are you good Tuesday? He's not good Tuesday. What about Wednesday? Literally had to, you know, get off the text and be like, well, talk to my wife, make sure the kids are good. And then we meet, we plan to meet up last night. And then right at the last second, I'm ready to get out the door. Oh man, I can't come. Let's just, let's just do it over the phone. So start a little planning session over the phone. Yeah. Sometimes that works out a little bit easier anyway, especially with everybody's schedules. Like I know, like you said, Max is busy. You're busy. Like the hell shit. When we were at Canwell, I mean, you like, you were working a day shift, a night shift plus volunteering for CWB and you know, we're, we're in many hats. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. At, um, Actually, Canweld was my first ever welding conference. I wish I had started earlier, gone to more, or even planned to go to more. Um, but like, it really it opened my eyes, it opened my mind to to what these uh, conferences are. But I was definitely working, and it was my first time going to one, my first time working at one. Uh, like, super exciting stuff. Yeah. Did you get to catch any of the uh, the seminars? I sat in on a few of them. I wanted to see Jim Galloway's presentation for sure. And I wanted to see uh, Patricio's Patricio, Patricio Mendez, yeah. but missed out on that one. Yeah. Uh, just cause I was sitting out there trying to catch people in the crowd and, and get their opinions on, on what the conferences are and what they've been sitting on. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's insane uh, what, what people are doing and um, like, the the fact that I can hardly understand what they're talking about welding technology wise makes me interested, right? I've sometimes you get stuck in a lane where you're just doing the same thing all day, every day. And like just to just to sit in on one of those sessions just opens your mind. Oh, for sure, man. I mean, that's like when I when I first got out of doing structural steel ironwork and got into education. I was like, man, I need to learn more about, you know, this welding stuff, especially if I'm going to teach it because it's more than just 7018 and flux core and, you know, banging bolt pins and stuff and bolts, right? There's more to this whole welding thing. So I decided, I was like, yeah, I'll sign up for a seminar. And, you know, AWS headquartered right here in in Florida, you know, I was like, I'll pop down to Miami. I'll sit in on a, a seminar and, you know, I'll learn some stuff. And I signed up for the wrong seminar, but it was, it was the right seminar, but it was like way, way above my pay grade. I went down there. 
uh, Bill Newell is like a big name within AWS, within welding and stuff here stateside. And I went to his pre and post weld heating conference and it was all on P91 pipe. And I didn't know what the hell P91 pipe was. I, I completely missed that in the description. I thought he was just going to talk about pre and post heat. So I went down there and they're like talking way over my head, but I just sat there. I shut up and yeah. I just paid attention. And like, I was picking up on some keywords, you know, there, there's some regular words that us welders can pick up on in an engineering conference. Is, is this, yeah. Yeah. Is this the same Chrome that's on my, uh, on my hitch ball? Like I, I don't understand. Exactly. This. And I'm, I'm like, dude, this is like way over my, why would you want Why do you have to do that? Like there's just so much involved in it and you can't, you can't do any inspections until like 24 hours after the root pass. That's when you can actually inspect the root pass. And there's all these precautions you got to take, but it really got me out of my comfort zone, which was good. And so I learned a little bit from that conference that was like way out, like I said, way outside my scope. And then I went to another conference and I learned some more stuff that was like way outside my scope. And I went to another seminar and another conference and, you know, a trade show and this, that. And I just kept going to these different classes. And the more I sat with these people, the more I talked to them, the more I learned, the more all this stuff just started making sense. It started clicking, you know, because I wasn't, yeah, I, I was able to get outside of my comfort zone. I think a lot of times we kind of, we like it there. It's, it's safe. It's secure. We know what's going on. Um, and it's uncomfortable to grow, but you put yourself in those, you know, those yeah. stressful situations, you learn so much more. Yeah. You, you never grow if you're just in your same little bubble. Uh, it's when you get uncomfortable and make mistakes that you do start growing. Um, you're absolutely right about that. Like the CWB association, like we put on, uh, events and dinners and stuff where we promote technology. I remember when Fronius first rolled into town. And, you know, I went to one of those and they're welding 10 gauge plate, one inch wide gap with MIG uh, aluminum. Like, oh, this isn't possible. It's, it, that's crazy. And here they are just doing mm -hmm. it super easy. Uh, I remember going to Lincoln ones with stainless steel uh, MIG for pipe going downhand, like all these different things. And if I just stayed in my shop doing the same weld over and over again, I'd never know that. So I, I've learned more and more that you have to put yourself out there. You have to go to these things. Um, it, it makes you a better person, makes you a better welder. And even getting that knowledge and bringing it back to your shop, trying to get other people interested, it uh, it helps you. It helps the shop. If you don't, if you don't move with technology, if you don't uh, get that knowledge you're going to die. Like the, that's, that's, that's it. If you don't move with technology, you'll get buried. Yeah. You're going to be left behind. Yeah. Yeah. It's, <clears throat> and, and things are changing at such a rapid pace. I mean, you were talking about Fronius. I remember when they first came in, they did a, a demo where they welded a strip of aluminum to a chunk of galvanized. I was like, you can't weld that stuff. Well, <laughs> sure. I so. have one of those. Yeah, that CMT. I have one of those. Cold metal transfer. I guess yeah, they do it for. It's like a business card. Yeah, yeah. They, I think they yeah. do it for Mercedes Benz because that's how they attach some of the pieces in the bumpers. But it's, the funny thing is, is like everything we've been told about welding that you can't do it this way. You shouldn't do it this way. There's people out there that are, that are doing it. Like people tell you, oh, you're not supposed to run downhill 7018 and it's not meant for open route applications. Meanwhile, in Europe, they're over there writing welding procedures, downhill 7018 open route applications. And you're like, what? No, you're not, you're not supposed to do that. Well, you can, you can bend a lot of these rules. Some of these rules you can even break and you can get away with it and you can get good results. Yeah. Instead of long arcing it and letting the flux fall, why don't you bury that thing in there and see what happens? Right? Exactly. I mean, there's, there's just so many different things you can, and that's the cool thing about welding. You know, I say it all the time. The more I learn about welding, the more I realize I don't know shit about welding. And it's just going to, yeah, you're never, yeah. Yeah. Going, going to all these little conferences, trade shows, conventions, and like, just even, you know, there, there might not even be a conference or a seminar, just talking to other like-minded individuals about what they're doing. You know, what are you, what are you doing in the industry? Oh, damn. I didn't know you could do that. And you know, like you start exchanging information and like theories and stuff that you're working on and you pick up on a lot of this cool stuff. Like you said, you bring it back to your shop. you you become more valuable at the end of the day. It's all these little nuggets of wisdom that you get to, you know, lock away in your toolbox that, you know, it's going to make you a better welder for tomorrow. Absolutely. Like welding is that thing where you're never an expert at, you never top out. There's always something, something's always changing. There's always something for you to learn. Like I'm a, I'm a pretty well-rounded welder. I've touched on a lot of different industries, but I, I'm definitely not the best. I, there's always something I can work on, right? 
Yeah, that's that's my thing too. Is like once you and, and you know for somebody to say that oh I've perfected that process. Okay, well have nope. Yeah, no, there's there's <laughs> no way. It's like I, I I run across people all the time just in like everyday life, and they're like oh what do you do for a living? You know I'm a welder. Oh yeah, my uncle you know he's a he's a master welder. Like never heard of that term. Like I don't break their heart right there on the spot. I'd be like oh really? Tell me more. <laughs> like that, yeah. but they really don't know enough. But it, like I don't think anybody should consider themselves a master welder because there's so many different exactly. processes, so many different alloys, so many different applications. You you can't master them all. It's like Pokemon. You're, you're never going to catch them all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's very true. Yeah. I like that reference. And yeah, they just keep making, making new Pokemon. Same thing with, with welding technology. I mean, look at all the innovations that they're coming out with now. You got like your laser welding, the cobots, the whole automation area is like blowing up. Now they're incorporating artificial intelligence with these yeah, cobots. Huge. It's nuts. Hey, that was another session that I got to sit on at Canweld um, was using robots and AI to make up the gap. Because right now everybody knows like you can't hire anyone. If you hire somebody, you have to train them. It takes a long time. They might not work out. And like here's people just putting up a robot and teaching it the one thing and then ai takes over it's literally measuring um everything about the weld pool everything about the magnetic field around it it's got cameras it's got sensors and eventually this thing's just pumping out parts and the welds are perfect it it kind of just like you would tune your own weld though it needs more wire or more heat yeah um but like this thing's doing it real time And eventually it's just pumping them out, pumping them out. And that's happening right now. Yeah. I mean, like you, you still have to have somebody to train that robot to do that, you know, on, on site. I was talking to uh, Corey Mays. He's got that shop down in uh, Texas. I got to meet him at the, um, uh, which conference, the, not the IEC conference, the uh, automation conference I went to for AWS. I mean, that, that was a whole cool deal. They did it up there at the Ohio state university and everything, but I got to talk to him and do a podcast he started implementing cobots before he needed cobots before everybody was like, well, cobots could be a solution to, you know, staff shortages and, and welder shortages and skilled trades people and stuff like that. He was using them like long before. So he adopted this technology and he's like, if it's, if anything, it's allowed me to hire other welders and put them on the more complex parts. So I use the cobot as like, you know, a supplement to a lot of the stuff we're doing, the mundane tasks that, Nobody really wants to do because it's the same weld over and over and over, but like it's a good chunk of our business, so it has to get done. You know, he can hire somebody that's like fresh out of welding school and say, hey, here's the machine. You know the theory behind it as far as like wire feed, travel speed, uh, you know, volts, work angle, contact tip. Like, you know that stuff. Like, and he'll show them how to program that robot and they can just sit there and rip through parts all night. Yeah. So, I mean, it, in that aspect, it makes yeah. sense, but technology is now... Like I said, they're incorporating AI with that. I don't, I don't know how exactly. Um, I'd be more interested to hear some more information on incorporating artificial intelligence. I mean, you think about it. At the end of the day, it's pretty freaking scary too. I was just gonna say we need to get to that point just before Skynet. Yeah. <laughs> we're okay, and then pump the brakes, right? Just don't. If they exactly, yeah, we can't let them build themselves. Uh, we're in trouble. Oh yeah, you're, unless you're we're done. already in the matrix. Yeah. Uh, then, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So what what have you been working on, like as far as like your your work balance as a welder and stuff like that? What kind of projects? I seen your uh, your video today. That was pretty dope. The um, putting a putting an extra tack there in the corner to kick that leg out. Yeah. So uh, for those that don't know, I am a shop foreman. Uh, I work at JR's Welding in Regina, Saskatchewan, and depending on how busy we are. I see between, you know, I oversee 14 to 20 people. Um, So that's taken me a little bit away from my love of welding. So I I take on a little bit of extra stuff after hours uh, because I can't get to it during the day. So that video today was I was building a little stainless steel stand and I'm working by myself and I don't have extra hands and I don't like to get a bunch of stuff out clamps. So I like to put a little extra tack in the corner before I bring in my piece. So that way one hand holds the piece, the other hand holds the torch. I melt that tack and right away leg fuses and it just brings it just about square. 
t- and the gaps are tight. So all I have to do after that is grab a, a, a two foot square, hold it in one hand, tack, hold it the other side, tack, and I'm done. That literally took me one minute. You know, I don't want to rag on the guys that, you know, set up eight clamps and they got three squares tacked to the thing or uh, sorry, clamped to the thing, you know? Yeah. Okay. You've done this. You've spent a half an hour putting a leg on. Well, if you're in a production shop, if you're, you know, trying to, let's say, beat out the other guy with pricing, these are the tricks and and these tricks aren't being taught anymore. It's, it's, you don't have that, that upper guy saying, Hey, you could do it better. You could do it quicker. So I like to make those little videos to, to help people, whoever's following me or who's, whoever sees that video. Um, what I've noticed too, though, is the educational stuff, the longer videos don't get seen. Right. I, I, the algorithm kind of screws people on that one. So I've noticed too, like the silly videos that I make, they get, you know, almost a million views. And then the educational stuff that I make, not so much. I get a lot of support from the the close community, but yeah, it's yeah, it doesn't have as much of a reach. What, what's it called? Edutain edutainment. Yeah, you need to to be educational and ed- edutainment. Yeah, educational and entertaining. Yeah, that's that's the hard part is finding that you know that mix because you know everybody now has the attention span of a goldfish. It's like if you got to grab somebody within the first eight seconds, and if it's it, which is weird. Because you would think at the, the, you know, bringing in technology as far as videos, you know, for people that have their attention spans too short to read, like I'm big on watching videos or audio books or stuff like that, because you, you'll lose me in text a lot of times. So videos like that, that's awesome. You know, if I can find something, you know, you can break down a, a three or four chapters in like a two, three minute video, like I'm all over it. But people nowadays, like you got to show them yeah. in like five, seven, eight seconds, boom, they're on to the next video. Like you got to, and you, you have to figure out a way to hold their attention span. I think it's with, um, I just did that podcast or Podfest expo down here in Florida. It's like, I was telling you, it's like a podcast conference. And they were saying one of the guys, uh, I think John Lee Dumas has an alarm set on his phone. Uh, it, and it just vibrates and it's 90 seconds. So every 90 seconds during his YouTube videos, something happens, something changes, yeah. the screen changes, something, you know, like a little fly in comes out of the corner, a little pop up, something happens. So that it's just like an indication for him to do something. And so he'll just reach over and tap a little button on his board and, and something will happen. And that that's what causes people to, to stay there. And it's something like, I guess, psychological, but, right, yeah. but we've got such short attention spans now. Yeah, like, nine, how do you teach somebody anything? Yeah, exactly. 90 seconds. That's the length of a reel on Instagram. Exactly. Right? So this this guy's got the this guy's got the pew 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 button, right? Keep people on their toes. Pretty much. But it's all like it's all visual, like graphics or you know, yeah, like no, the it's, camera angle changes or something happens. Yeah. No, that's um that's good that you mentioned videos because I've been fortunate enough to to film a few videos, educational videos for the CWB Association. And that's kind of where they were headed too. Like I realized something pretty quick once I started focusing on welding on Instagram is that you, you learn from these videos. It's easy. It's accessible. So now we've got these, you know, educational videos, which are less than five minutes. And like, I'm a fitter, I'm a welder. I've done a ton of stuff. So these little tricks, just like my video yesterday, I've made videos with the CWB association and put them up there. And literally like being part of the association is free. Like it's, it's one of the most accessible associations out there anyways, like welding, joining, whatever, but you're a member, you click on that. That's free content. And I guarantee you, you will learn something, something you might've been welding for 20 years. You go on there, hit that link and just bam, you're instantly better. Yeah. Max is doing a kick-ass job with that. I know that's kind of like his his uh, his pet project. I mean, he's been really passionate about bringing all that stuff in, bringing all that content in, um, you know, just to benefit everybody. And it seems to be paying off. Yeah, I think so. I, I knew Max when he was an instructor at uh, SAS Polytech here in Regina. And uh, I would have never thought that he would go to where he is right now, like super driven guy. And he calls me up one day. He's like, Hey, guess who's the, guess who's the new boss there at the association? I don't know. 
it's me. Like, no, you're <laughs> lying. You're crazy. But like, I think he's been in that position now for almost three years mm -hmm. and it's exploded. It's exploded. I'm fortunate enough to know him and to, to be able to do stuff with him. So it's, it's crazy. Is that, is that where you went to school? Like, was he your instructor or one of the instructors at your school? He, no, he was not my instructor. He was actually an instructor after I had left school. Okay. Um, but a lot of the students that I get or the new welders that I get, um, they've take, they've taken his courses and everyone says the same thing. Like, wow, that guy knows his stuff. He's so like well-rounded and like passionate, passionate. But yeah, I, I took a pre-employment course. That's where I really learned to weld, which was um, an eight month course. And after that, that gives you level one and level two uh, worth of book work, I guess you could say. You build up your hours and then you go right into third year and then you can write the interprovincial journeyman exam. So yeah, about about three years in, became a journeyman. That was 2008. So I've been professionally welding, I guess, now for about 18 years. Nice. And when, when did you take on the role of uh, supervisory position? Uh, almost three years ago. So we were kind of coming out of COVID um, as a shop and uh, there was a lot of frustrations during that time. Um, so moves needed to be made in the shop and I I put my hat in there. I was always, I was lead hand for a really long time and I was wondering like, what's the next step? What's the next step? And eventually it came. So I jumped all over it. The shop needed some leadership. Uh, shop needed and I'm not I'm not bragging I'm the most humble guy that that you know but like I'm super well-rounded and I know things I know how to fix every piece of equipment in the shop I know where everything is in the shop I know how to run every welder in the shop so it just made sense they needed that person and and I I stepped up nice now which which do you prefer being on the tools or being in the supervisory position <laughs> oh, I knew that question was coming. Uh, I miss the tools so badly. I I just I love welding and it's sometimes it hurts when I explain something to somebody exactly how to do it, how the best way to do it is. I come back five minutes later and it's completely wrecked. <laughs> it's not what I said at all. I was like, okay, it would have been quicker, easier for me to do it. Yeah. And it would have been done right, but that's that's where I got to disconnect a little bit. I'm still learning. Like there is no there's no formal training to become a foreman. It's something you do. You learn on a daily basis, and it's hard because you're dealing with different people, different mindsets, different personalities, different skill sets. Um, like, can you swear on this podcast? I can. My guests can't. No, I'm fucking with you. Go ahead. Oh, okay, well, it's a poop. <laughs> no, go ahead. <laughs> okay, so it's a literal shit sandwich because you get the shit from below and you get the shit from above and you're kind of stuck in the middle. You're like the filter for the shop, right? You got to gauge what's coming from below and what you tell up, you know, upstairs and what's going on up here and what you can tell the guys because <sighs> like some of this stuff, nobody needs to know about like i always say it's um a mistake's not a mistake if you can fix it before nobody sees right mm -hmm. so yeah there's some things that just need to be filtered down but yeah being foreman is different we'll go back to yes i miss the tools so badly um and i just uh that's i think that's why i take on so much more after hours because i just i have to stay fresh um, I still keep my pressure ticket, um, up to date because I do have a couple of pressure welders at the shop. So like, I always come from the mindset of, I can't ask you to do something and explain to you how to do it if I don't know how to do right. it. And if I don't know how to do it, we'll work together to figure it out. Right. I just, that's, that's my mindset anyway. No. And I mean, that's, that's the way it should be. Like, I don't get into academia. Jeez. Everybody that thinks they know how to do your job, they're going to tell you how to do your job. But that was, that was the thing when, uh, <laughs> so when, when I was on my tools and I got promoted to foreman, like I, I would get in trouble by the general foreman 
because he'd come out on the job site, just check, you know, make sure everything's going according to plan. And he'd, he'd, he'd walk out there and he'd find me on my tools. I'd be over there like, you know, trying to sneak in a weld here and there, you know, helping the guys. He's like, no, 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 you, you can't do that because like it was a whole union thing. So it got to the point where like we'd be loading up for a job and he'd come over to the truck and he'd make sure that I wasn't loading my toolbox onto the truck along with the other guys. I mean, it got to a point like that. And I was like, oh, come on, man. Like, let me just go out there. And he's like, no, you can either, you're either going to be the foreman or you're going to be the worker. And right now I need you as, yeah. I need you as the foreman. Cause I know you can go out there and get it done, Yeah, I, but you get so much more respect from the yeah. guys and, and the gals that are out there. If you can do it too. Cause if you go out there and you critique them or you, you tell them how to do something and you can't do it yourselves, that they don't really respect that. But if they know that you can get out there and work right alongside of them and get it done and do it to, you know, the standards that you expect out of them, they respect you a whole hell of a lot more. Yeah, no, that's absolutely true. And I've been told like, Hey, what are you doing over there? You need to be doing laps of this shop till you get dizzy, right? I'm also quality control, right? So I have to be checking on everybody. I know some guys don't need as much checking up as others, but yeah, if there's a lull in the day, if there's a little downtime, I'll go grab that. I'll go punch some holes. I'll go sweep. I'll do whatever I, because the worst thing is to see a guy standing around. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff going on in my head and, you know, like on my clipboard, there's so many things that happen that, you know, people don't see, but you see a guy standing around, it just makes you want to stand around. And it's just like one bad apple ruins the whole bunch, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So, yeah, I, I still try to get in there. Actually, today, guys were doing MIG uphand with uh, solid wire on some really dirty stuff. So. You know, I got my lid on, went and checked on a guy and say, hey, do you, do you need dad to show you how to do that? <laughs> or are you good? So, yeah, we, we worked on a few things to try to get it to look a little better. And, and uh, yeah, I, 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 can't, I can't get away from it. You need that arc time if you're going to stay, if you're going to stay fresh. Yeah, for sure. So what, what do you do outside of work that you can kind of like stay up to date on everything and kind of, kind of scratch that itch? Well, Yeah. Yeah, kind of, well, short of, of being involved with my, my CWB Association chapter and kind of promoting that stuff and checking in on technology, um, I take on like quite a bit of side work, which um, I'm more of an artistic guy. So, you know, building handrails, uh, doing stairs, uh, stainless steel, aluminum, ornamental stuff. I've been really focusing on, you know, upper end homes, residential stuff. So that's kind of how I stay fresh. And I, you know, everyone says, oh, oh, TIG is the best. I love TIG. Well, yeah, I mean, it is fun. So, and not a lot of people can do it and can do it well. And, you know, we do have a, a full-time TIG guy at my shop, but he can't take on what I take on. So I work a little extra hours and make some money and put out some cool stuff. Very cool. Now, how do you, how do you drum up business doing that? Um, different ways. Um, so it's kind of a side venture through the shop. So we have our regular work and then I've kind of been working on this residential side, this, you know, uh, higher end stuff. And we've been messing with some brass too, which is kind of exciting. Um, but usually it comes through the shop and if we can't handle it during the day or we don't have the, the skill set during the day, then I'll take it on after hours. I also have a welder at home. Um, which I do some artwork. I've, I've made flowers, insects, all this kind of stuff. So it's kind of how I do it. Um, and I've done a few handrails on my own. Don't tell work. I'm not stealing work <laughs> from them. Don't worry. But <laughs> I've done a few. Yeah, I've done a few things uh, on the side. I've got a few welding buddies here that, and, that I learn from and that I team up with. Oh, very cool. Yeah, I pick up a little bit of stainless work because like, Apparently there's not a lot of people in this area that can do it. So I do like restaurant repair work, but just stuff that I can like pick up on the way home and drop off the next day. I can kind of do it on my terms. It's not like a real rush job just because my schedule, like, like you, you're like, I don't know what's going on. I mean, I know what's going on from one minute to the next, but it's hard to like plug in those empty voids and say, I can get it done, you know, today. Um, but I went to go, yeah. they were, they were kind of tired of waiting on me. Cause I, I think I was up at uh Canwell when they called and I was like, hey, dude, I'm in Canada right now. I'll give you a buzz when I get back. So I pick up these uh, these pieces <laughs> from this restaurant, right? And they're all like little fryer baskets and cooking accessories and all this stuff. And it 
it pays really well for the short amount of time that it takes me to actually get this stuff done. And he's like, I, I'm looking at this basket. I'm like, holy shit. Like who, who tried to fix this? And they're like, yeah, we had, um, <laughs> we, we had this, uh, we had this guy from, he's, he's still in school, you know, he's trying. And I was like, yeah, he, he definitely tried <laughs> like this. This thing's jacked, dude. <laughs> there was more sugar in that damn thing than a freaking Coca-Cola. It was nuts. The whole thing, like everywhere he touched with a torch, it was just, it was burnt. I had to cut out and like put all new back in. But stainless is, stainless is fun, but it's got some nuances to it. And if you're not familiar with it, you can, you could screw it up pretty quick. But I like stainless because it, it, it makes you think outside the box. You gotta, you gotta get creative with, you know, heat sinks and all that. Yep. That's exactly it for people that just don't know and like, oh yeah, I can weld that. No problem. Uh, you're going to have a problem. Exactly. Heat sinks, you know, back purging, um, stainless just pulls like crazy. You've got this thing squared up. You're, you're going to put one more tack in over there and, oh man, like half an inch out of square now. Where, where did this go wrong? Yeah. I've, I've watched people weld like a, a base plate to a stainless steel, like piper, you know, square tube even. And as they're welding around the base, you can actually watch that, you know, thing over the course of like a couple of feet. It'll just move yeah. inches one way or the other. And you're like, holy shit. It's, it's crazy how much that yeah. stuff will draw. And, yep. And you'll see that base plate curl up pretty crazy too. So unless you're pulling the heat out of that or you're pre-stressing it, that's what you're stuck with. Yeah. I was actually, I was talking to my distributor the other day. Um, I, now I got to find the business card, right? I, it's around here somewhere. Uh, but they use vibration as a heat sink or to do stress relief. So instead of post weld heat treatment to relieve the stress, they have they clamp all this stuff down to a vibrating table. And I guess it vibrates at a certain certain uh, frequency or hertz or whatever. Like if you put your hand on there, you're really not it's not gonna, you know, it's not bouncing your hand off the place. But you can clamp this entire stainless fixture down and can, you know, weld everything. And then once you're done, you just disconnect all the clamps and everything and it, it's just perfectly flat. I've never heard of that, but as soon as you mentioned it, I could see how that would work, right? Like, like an ultrasonic cleaner. Yeah, exactly. It just, you don't see it working and all of a sudden like this thing's coming yeah. out. I could definitely see but that. They're doing it for vibrating all the yeah. atoms, getting, they're doing bullet. it for post weld heat treatment. And yeah. my, my distributor, he's like, you ever heard of this stuff? Like, he's, cause he's thinking, he's like, if anybody's heard of it, you've heard of it. And I was like, I've never heard of it. And, um, he said, apparently the technology has been around for like 40 years. And I was like, yeah, this, this is the first time I've ever heard of it. It's, yeah, it's weird. Like a lot of these new ideas aren't actually new ideas. We're just now catching up with technology. But yeah, a lot of these thoughts 40, 50, 60 year, years ago, they were thinking about these yeah. things. So it's, it's yeah, it's wild. That's like you're the, the STT, the RMD, and the cold metal transfer from Fronius. That technology's been around since the 80s, but nobody's really wanted to yep. adopt it. And it's been there the whole time. And now, you yep. know, here we are in you know, 2024 and people are like, Hey man, you hear about this new mode of metal transfer? It's, like, it's not new, man. It's, it's been around for like 40 years. <laughs> nobody's just, nobody's yeah. ever, nobody's <laughs> ever used it or adopted it, you know? And I think that might've put us behind because yeah, everybody's like, you know, why change? It's, you know, we, we, this is the way we've always done it. You got to get out of that mentality. Yeah. And I mean, sometimes too, it's, it's cost maybe back then, like, oh, you had to spend $100,000 for this machine you might use once or twice. Now it's affordable. And because you have that technology, you're not going to use it once or twice. You're going to try to use it on every single thing, right? Yeah, the, the waveforms and everything that's out there, all the new technology, it's just, it's insane. And it's, it's coming faster than we can adopt it. Yeah, we just recently picked up uh, a Lincoln 300C Advance. Oh. And that's the, f yeah, that's the first machine that we've had at the shop that has pulse. Right. So none of the guys really know how to run it, but here we are playing with buttons and okay. Like one, one of the guys good for him had it dialed in and here we are doing solid wire MIG welds, no spatter and barely any smoke coming off of it. Like where, where was this? Can we swap all these machines out? Because this is, sweet. you can for a fee, <laughs> you can for a fee. <laughs> Wait up. There it is. There's the There's cost, the cost to entry. Yeah. No, yeah, but I mean like, um, because I remember the first time I got to use, so uh, their their marketing's a little weird on that because they came out with the the C three hundred back in like twenty sixteen. Lincoln did, 
And I thought that was, I was like, dude, this is the end all be all. And then they came out with the S350 with the advanced module, which had even more features and functions. And then they stepped and they just, they changed, they took that letter C from the C300 and put it at the end. So now it's the 300C advanced. And you're like, okay, it's like a little bit, it's yeah. a smaller, smaller platform. Uh, you got the integrated vertical uh, water cooler on the back. You can put that on there, dual tank cylinders, like all that, uh, or the dual cylinder cart. But all of that same technology was in the C300. So, but with the three, with yeah. the C or with the 300C, like everything changes internal, like all your polarities, they'll change internally. So if you set it over to flux core self-shielded, it changes polarity on the inside. But those machines are so sick. You've got to look into, uh, if you got thin gauge sheet metal, look into the rapid arc and rapid X functions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are freaking sick. We haven't played with it yet, but I I remember I got a friend, I got a friend, Sebastien at uh, Lincoln, and he came um, and, and did a demo once, and that was what he showed off. And uh, I haven't played with it at the shop yet, but it's all time. Like time is money. So usually you want to be working on something, but you don't want to be practicing right. on something. Yeah. So yeah, I, I can't wait. Dude, it's uh cause I, I think that was one of the first videos I did with weld.com when Bob Moffat actually came out of the school that I was working at. I showed him rapid arc, rapid X. He'd never seen it before. And I was like, check this out, man. Eight oh thirty five diameter wire, 800 inches a minute on eighth inch coupons. Oh, eighth inch coupons. And like you, by the time yeah. you pull the trigger, like yeah. you, you're already at the end of the joint. It's sick. It, it's super, super quick. But it's it's great for because you can throw a lot of heat into a part really quick. So you lower your heat input because even though you're you're like pouring the coals to it at 800 inches a minute, your travel speed is so fast that plate doesn't have time to get hot. You're just in and out, boom. So you can take it completely yeah. gets rid of any warpage. You don't have to deal with the spatter. It's much lower fume. It's it's nuts. Yeah, that's what some people don't understand. And when we're just talking about welding stainless, right? Sometimes cranking the heat up and moving faster is better than just hanging out there and letting it build up. You're actually putting way more heat mm -hmm. into it. So yeah, I can definitely see how that'd be helpful. Right now, we've got a job that we're welding a lot of uh, really thin gauge galvanized. So if we can get that machine tuned in to be doing that, like 20, 20 gauge, 18 gauge galvanized, that would be very beneficial oh dude switch over to um what the hell is it nr nr211 it's a self-shielded flux core but it's like that's what it's built for yeah. is welding on thin gauge galvanized material because maximum thickness is for that is 5 16 i believe but it it okay. runs it runs really good Sweet. it runs really good on uh on, on galvanized you don't have to like clean the base metal or any of that shit like it it, it runs good well, that's really cool because right now we went down to a smaller wire a 023 wire Right. And we are doing a little bit of grinding, a little bit of prep. So it's all time. It's all time and smaller wire, less deposition. Yep. So that's cool. See, just being on this podcast, here we are. And then, something. and then step, and, and it sounds counterintuitive, but step up your wire diameter. So instead of running like an 023 wire, switch over to an 045 flux core and you can weld like thin yeah. gauge sheet metal on for galvanized with 045. And you'll, you'll get rid of the warpage. And oh, I believe it's, 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 it's slick. Yeah. But that, those are the things that, like, definitely believe that, that's my thought wire. process is, oh, it's thinner material, smaller diameter wire. Yeah. Which is, you know, like, oh, easier to control, easier to learn off of. But even when I was kind of training the guys to do this stuff, it's, uh, oh, I used to do this with four or five all the time back in the day. I'm not kind of, I'm not fronting on them, but I can weld 16 gauge galvanized with four or five wire. As long as you know what you're doing, you got your settings just right. But yeah, they don't believe me unless I show them. But this is uh, this is good because that that four or five flux core wire, you have the flux in there, so you're not actually putting in four or five wire into this stuff. Right. So it's uh, it's I, I could see this working very well. Yeah, it's good stuff. Just make sure you got good fume extraction and everything because you okay. still got to burn through the galvanize and all that. Yeah, we have a dedicated area which you know our ventilation isn't the greatest. It's an it's an older setup, right? But we've got a dedicated area with a hood above and two different hoses that you can put right into your piece. So oh, there you go. And the guy's wearing a respirator. Yeah, so we do have we do have that setup. That's one thing that I've really kept in mind is the safety. Even when I was coming up, it's like what's a mask? Like, like screw these glasses. Yep. But now it's 
why why were we that stupid like we should we should actually take care of ourselves oh being being dumb was a, it was like a badge of honor and like all the old old hats where you know they were doing the same <laughs> stuff and they'd give you shit about it be like what do you need a harness for you wimp you know like or you know just whatever safety glasses yeah. you don't need safety glasses but like hold on let me put my jacket on you don't need a jacket to weld uh yeah i don't like skin yeah, cancer they, <laughs> yeah I, exactly i know that like i hear these stories like back in the day you couldn't see like 10, 20 feet across from you in the shop because it was so smoky. Everyone was burning rods, some 70, 14, 70, 24. That's all they were doing. No respirators. They're all smoking yep. underneath their hoods. And like, where are they now? <laughs> well, that was the thing because I'd get, you know, I'd get um, kids' parents would come with them, you know, to do like a, a tour at the school and everything. They're like, well, you know, I know, you know, so-and-so in my family, they were a welder for like 20 years and you're like, now they're blind and they got lung cancer and this, that, and the other thing. And it's like, we do things a lot different nowadays, like fume extractors, you know, safety glasses, the right tinted lens, you know, like all this, all this safety. I mean, it's there for a reason because a lot of people suffered because they didn't have access to the equipment or they were just too stubborn to use it at the time. And like, I came up with a generation that I was too stubborn to use a lot of that stuff. And I think that's why. I'm so big on it now is because I'm educating people, you know, and I've, I've, yeah. I've started adopting a much better safety habits while I'm in the shop. Even, I mean, hell, even at the house, you know, I bought a papper system for all the stainless that I'm doing because I don't have fume extraction. You know, I'd, I'd open the door and, and blow it out yeah. with a fan for the longest time, but now, you know, I'm using a papper system, but yeah. I mean, that's like, that's what I should have been doing all along or at least a respirator, yeah. you know? Yeah. I'm, I've, yeah, I'm from the the same school that you went to exactly. I, I, up to like five six years ago, I was still being stupid. Now it's whenever I'm doing something and I know the risks, I'm gonna take those steps to get rid of those risks. I've, you know, in my younger career, I got a guard, I got a grinder to the face. Mm. Right? Was I wearing a face shield? No. Was there a guard on the grinder? No. So whose fault is that? Mine. And I could have died, right? It hit me right here in the chin. I got a beard, but you can't see it, right? But it carried down and left me a scar right here. And if that, if my wound here on my chin, which like I was blown open, you could see my teeth right through my lip. Jeez. If that had happened where my neck is, game over. Like, Yeah, you'd have been done. So, oh yeah, for sure. So take the extra five minutes. I always tell the guys that I work with, it's like, if you have that feeling or you have that thought before you do something that this might go wrong or this might be dangerous, that's your brain telling you to maybe look a little harder at what you're doing. Yep. Don't just go for it and like, oh, let's squint and like, oh, wince away from the grinder. No, something's going to go wrong, right? That's that's usually my so indication. If you get that feeling. Yeah, exactly. That's My indication is when, ah, oh, this will only take a second. Not that's that's a good indication. I need to put some PPE on because that that second is usually when shit goes <laughs> shit gets western really quick. Yeah, yeah, you know when you're being sketchy. You absolutely do. So if you're going to be dumb, you better be tough or put some PPE on. All right, we're gonna go ahead and take a quick commercial break. This segment of the Arc Junkies podcast is brought to you by Everlast Welders. Are you looking to upgrade your current setup? Maybe you need a true multi-process machine. Or you'd like to have the ability to perform other processes in the shop, but you just don't have access to the right equipment. Well, Everlast has your solution. They have a machine for every budget, process, and skill level. And all Everlast IGBT inverter machines come with a stock five-year warranty. Check out a full list of their machines and full capabilities at everlastwelders.com. And as always, if you buy any machine that comes with a stock foot pedal, be sure to type in Arc Junkies in the comments section and get that free Nova foot pedal and TIG Torch upgrade. Everlast Welders. Weld mean, weld green. Now let's get back to the show. Well, especially now that you're in a supervisory position, I mean, it's you're kind of responsible for everybody's safety and well. I mean, everybody at the end of the day is responsible for everybody's safety and well-being on the job site. But I mean, you more especially, you know, because you're supposed to be that that yeah. guiding light, that mentor, that supervisor that's making sure things are happening the correct way, you know? Exactly. I'm not ragging on you. I just don't want you to lose a finger today right? It's, and some guys don't take it very well. And it's a hard conversation to have, but Hey man, go put on your respirator. Well, I'm only doing this for like two seconds. All right. I'm going to rephrase that. Hey, go put on your respirator. 
honestly, like I, I'll just hold my breath. Okay, stop right now. You're not continuing this until you have your respirator. Mm-hmm. And if they make a different choice than that, then you're not the guy. Sorry, man. See you. Yeah. That's I had uh, my brother-in-law bought this rusted ass boat trailer. I can't remember if I told this story in the podcast or not, but he bought this rusted ass boat trailer and we had to get it all cleaned up because we were going to repaint it and everything. And uh, so I, I take him over to the, the shop that I'm working at. You know, they said we could use the shop on the Saturday. So we get in there and, you know, I get the the grinder set up with the wire wheels and I got all the PPEs laid out, right? You know, I got long sleeve jackets on and everything. We're going to tuck them in, safety glasses, face shield. Well, he goes over there and just picks up a grinder with a wire wheel on it and just starts going to town. <laughs> And I'm like, whoa, 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 hold on, man. I was like, put put some safety glasses on. And then I got a face shield over here, you know, jacket, this, that, and everything. He's like, man, I don't need any of that stuff. And I'm like, I should have led with this. He he only has one eye. Right. He he lost he lost his Whoops. yeah, he lost his left eye like as a as a young kid with a nasty firecracker accident or firework accident. And um, so I told him, I was like, Ugh. I said, I don't want to sound insensitive. I don't I'm not trying to be a dick here, but you've only got one eye left. Right. <laughs> the last thing you, the yeah. last thing you need in there is, you know, a wire from this freaking wheel. Cause they're, I mean, you've been walking around the shop, even hell, even if you're not the one using the wire wheel, you walk around, you're like, damn, what keeps stabbing me in the side? Like, oh, yeah. tink, you know, you pull out a one inch chunk of freaking wire wheel out of you. Yeah. Yeah. I've literally, I've walked out of the hallway, coming out of the bathroom into the shop. I open the door, I walk into the shop and I caught a wire right here in my eyebrow. I didn't have my glasses down yet. And I caught it right here in my eyebrow. The guy was probably 20 feet away from me. It still happened. Yeah. And like, I, I got that scene from, from uh gladiator, you know, where he's like, Oh, the gods were kind enough to bless me with two eyes. <laughs> Cause he lost the yeah. eye, but lose, lose the other one. Where, where are you? Yeah, now? You're done. What are you doing? Yeah. I was, I was trying to tell him. Yeah. I was like, so now it's, it's absolutely mandatory. Yeah. It's got to be because, I mean, everybody's got this misconception that the, that the work's dangerous. It's not the work's dangerous. It's a lot of people want to cut corners. And they want to do things that aren't safe. But if you do things the correct way, you you guard yourself, you know, with the proper PPE. You check out your equipment before you use it, you know, not during use when it, you know, something happens. You check this stuff out before, you know, inspect your equipment, inspect your gear, make sure everything's good. Use the appropriate gear for what you're doing and you'll be fine. Yep. Yeah, it's it's crazy. I was I was never this big on safety until I got into education. And you know, now you got 20 kids running around a welding shop with, you know, 480 volts and, you know, 10,000 degree arcs and fire and all that stuff. You're like, "Whoa. Yep. <laughs> we got everybody's got a safety up here." Yeah, like we just you just exactly. You just got done saying that, you know, the work's not dangerous. It's it's but literally every piece of equipment in a welding shop could kill you or maim you. Uh, instantly Mm -hmm. you have to know how to use your stuff and if you don't know how to use it get somebody to show you and that person better know how to use it it's uh yeah it's an incident like what is it accidents are caused right there's there's a reason that the accident happened and it's usually like poor education yeah it's just lack of training lack of knowledge and that that's the way and that's why people ask me they're like hey should i go I want to be a welder. Should I go to school or should I like just try to fake it until I make it and get, I was like, no, 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 go to school. It's, it's going to put you on the fast track and you're going to, you're going to learn the right way to do things as opposed to if you get out in the shop or if you get out in the, you know, field or the shop, it's a crapshoot as to who's going to train you. And 90% of the time, the person that's going to train you, they weren't trained correctly either. So they're just going to teach you a whole bunch of bad habits that you're going to pass on to somebody else. And it just becomes a vicious cycle of yeah. people with bad habits, teaching those bad habits to other people. Yeah, I, I see a ton of that. I, again, I'm not mentioning names, but like tons of YouTube welders, tons of people here on Instagram, like just putting out content for the reason of just putting out content. I know welding instructors that purposefully put out misinformation to get views what what's the point here who are you just trying to become famous or are you trying to train people out here so yeah the the bad habits the bad information just being put out there is um i'm not into it like i'm completely against it uh the whole influencer thing i get called influencer all the time i don't like the term it, in fact when i went to canwell i said if you put influencer on my badge i'm staying in the hotel room I'm taking like, my badge off i it's 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 I'm taking my badge off. I'm just going to hang out. But it's um, that's that's one thing I like about working for the uh, association 
is that everything that I put out, everything we put out has been looked over by the certification, by the education. That's, that's, if you're watching this video, you know, it's certified, you know, it's good information. If you get on YouTube and you look at half these guys, they're not wearing the proper PPE. They're not using the right raw. They're not using the right technique, but here they are, you know, million views. Yep. And what sucks is like, that's where people are going to find that information. I was just going to tell you. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's where these up and comers, these kids are going to find the education. Um, like go to a welding school, go to a certified welding school. You're absolutely right. It's going to give you that edge, at least the base information that you need to know to be proficient at your, at your trade when you get out there. Yeah. And it is, it is going to set you on the, the, the correct path to know and identify different hazards or how things should work. So that when you, you know, like if you don't know anything about welding and you walk into a welding shop, like you're going to be there, you're going to want to prove a point that you belong there. And so you're going to be a little bit more overconfident in some of your skills. Whereas, you know, if you go through a welding school and you understand some of the hidden dangers that are, you know, inherent with these tasks and understand how to protect yourself, you can automatically identify like, I don't want to put my hand in that piece of equipment in this area because this is what's going to happen. You know, I, I tell students all the time when we're going through the training session, whether it's uh, the saw or the grinder or, you know, whatever, I said, this stuff cuts and shapes and punches holes in steel steel like up to three quarter inch what do you think it's going to do to your hands if you put it under that yellow you know that yellow safety guard with a big picture on it that shows somebody getting their fingers cut off what do you think is going to happen yep <laughs> that, that blows my mind uh, have i hate to tell on shit yeah yeah i hate to tell this story but we had a guide and uh it, it was on the shear and i always tell people like it's not the blade that's going to get you. It's the hold downs. Yeah. The hold downs are way before the blade. Um, unfortunately, this person had their foot on the pedal as they were feeding metal in. They slipped off of the piece of metal. And because their foot was on the pedal, their body weight actuated the hold downs. So their finger got squished underneath one of the hold downs. And like it shot all the meat right out of the end of that yep. thing. So it's not just being aware of the hazard, but being aware of what could lead to the hazard. So we don't mess around. That's the first thing I show somebody. If your hands are anywhere near this thing, your foot's not on the pedal. Yep. It's, it's so many things could get you. We had a dude that he got, I think he got a uh, medical discharge from the Marines when I was in, because that's exactly what he was doing. We had, we had this freaking shear and it was probably 12 foot wide, but it would, it would shear one inch thick plate. And the material hold downs that, that oh. come down, I mean, they're like, they're like four inch diameter. It's like a 50 ton and they, they you know, they run the whole 10 or 12 foot across the, the piece. And when they come down, they come down with a sense of urgency, you know, so like you, you'd get the material oh, yeah. exactly where you need it. Your hands are on, you know, this side of the guard, you step on the pedal, boom. And the, the, you know, those, the hold downs would engage like with a sense of urgency. And then the blade would come down a little bit slower and, you know, shear that plate off. Well, he had like some small components or whatever like very tiny, something he probably should have been cutting on the saw or, you know, something to that effect. But he put his hands up, up underneath the guard to hold that thin piece of material in place. And, he, you know, his fingers were well back away from the blade. I'll give him that. But he hit that foot pedal and it came down and boom, it took three of his fingers and turned them into ketchup packets. Gone, like within a second. Yep. Gone. <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah, it's uh, and I mean, we're kind of fortunate that we we get to deal with hydraulic equipment or electrical equipment, the old flywheel stuff, the old air equipment, uh -huh. like who that happens now, and there's no stopping it. And some some of the stuff we get to work with is pretty cool, but it's also pretty crazy when you think about it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's. Uh, I don't like to think about it too much because I, I don't know if it's because I'm older or it's because I have kids. But when you're younger, you just go ahead and do it, yep. right? You just go and do it. This is what I'm doing. Blah blah blah. Now it's like right away when I walk up to something, or I walk up to a job. It's like the horror story happens in my head. Like this is what's going to go wrong. This is what this thing can do to you. It's like ooh, well, because you've seen it. That sense of uh, yeah, yeah. I've seen it all myself. I've injured myself and. I've I've broken probably every piece of equipment in my shop, so I know what not to do. <laughs> <laughs> you know its limitations. Oh yeah. <laughs>
Let's not shear that AR-400. That's probably not so good on the blade. Yeah, probably not. You might want to plasma cut that. <laughs> what, what kind of stuff does your, your company produce? Uh, we do pretty much everything under the sun. Like I, I still say that we're the you know only shop in the area that will still fix your bar stool or your bed frame. Um, we're known for grain elevator repair, refinish, and construction. We supply that whole industry. We do most of Western Canada, upper United States. Um, but we do not turn down an opportunity. If we can handle it, we're going to do it. We do pressure piping. Like I said, we do stairs, handrails. Um, maintenance is a big one. Um, heavy equipment repair. Custom fabrication. I could go on and on. We we touch everything. Every everything that we can possibly handle, we're gonna do it. Okay, those are the best shops to work in. Like, so it's like a, more or less a job shop. Oh yeah, yeah. And I mean, I'm kind of unique in in my welding journey, my welding history. You know, most of the guys they spend two, three years somewhere and move on. Or, you know, if you're a rig welder, you go, you go to this job, you go to that job, you're jumping around. I've worked in the same shop for the last 18 years. They took me as an apprentice and now I'm foreman. It's, that's where I've been. And every time I wanted to leave, we had a chat. Maybe they threw me a couple bucks. Uh, maybe they gave me some different opportunities, but I was never bored. I was always doing something different. Yeah, those are fun. So I, I got a buddy. That's what kind of he does. I mean, his bread and butter is stairs and handrails. But I'd go work for him when like work got slow, or you know, like I needed extra cash or something like that. I'd go pop over on the weekends and work at his shop. And it was always, you never know what's coming through the door. You know, one day you're you're welding up a hitch yeah. on an RV, or you know, you're fixing you know floats on a pontoon boat, or you know, just whatever whatever people drop off. Yeah, that's th- both those things that you listed. I've done. Mm-hmm. Um, I've, I've had the opportunity to build shipping container pools recently. Um, actually just down the street from the shop, we put together a shipping container coffee house. Uh, it's just wild. The things you can come up with when you're like, you got to have the technology obviously in the shop to handle these things, but yeah, somebody brings in a broken piece of equipment. I think that's the most rewarding thing. Repair is the most rewarding thing. The guy brings in a piece of equipment. It's wrecked. He thinks it's totaled. You spend a day on it and the guy's back up and running, like you feel super good when you get that done. Mm-hmm. I, I like getting something that's completely wrecked or screwed up and it like you can just go through and start cutting things apart. But I mean, and that's you can only learn that on site. You can't learn that in a school. So I mean, schools are great for getting you on the fast track, teaching you the fundamentals, how to utilize the equipment, all the safety stuff, but you really got to get out into a shop to learn the fabrication components. Like I try to teach fabrication as much as possible. And I would beg faculty and staff, like, Hey, if you got something broke at the house, you know, a chair, a table, a desk, uh, you know, some, a family heirloom, like bring it in. Let me show the students. Here's how you would make this repair. Here's how you would fix this thing. Because you can only learn that in real life. Yeah. That's real world stuff. There's, there's no way to really chat. Like, to tackle that when you are just sitting in your booth welding the same coupon over and over again you know students have that mindset too like their coupons are six inches long now i've got to weld three feet what do i do right it's you definitely got to get out there and start doing it i actually like again i i don't turn down a challenge i fixed uh, a hundred year old light fixture once and it was made out of brass and I really didn't know what I was doing. So first I tried to weld it. So that didn't work. Then I tried to braise it. That didn't work. Eventually I started making it worse. You know, it was in two pieces. Now it's in four pieces. <laughs> uh, like, what am I doing? So I, I literally sat down and I, well, I overheated this thing. And what's the stuff that's coming off of it? Well, this thing was soldered together. So I literally put some clamps on it, fluxed it. And just poured some uh, solder into it, and then it it stayed together. So if I had never failed at doing that the first two times around, I wouldn't have never known how to fix it. You know, like <clears throat> I always have this thought: if everything comes easy to you, the second that something doesn't, you do not know how to deal. You don't know how to cope. It's 
all those people that have so much experience, it's because they've made those mistakes, right? They're super good at what they do because they've made so many mistakes in the past. Yeah. It also helps if you break a lot of shit too. Cause it, then, then you got no choice. You're like, damn, I got, I got to figure, I got to figure out how to no fix choice. this. Yeah. I, yeah. It's like, I'm, what is it? People don't know how to be broke. I, I've seen this like story a whole bunch of times. Like you don't need to have money. You just need to be able to fix your things or get some used <laughs> things and make them nice. Yes. <laughs> I've seen, yeah, that, that video, there was a bunch of those that went around. Um, yeah. You're not broke. You just don't know how to fix shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, we're, we're living in a throwaway society though. Like we've, as humans, we've gone to this point, you know, back in the day, thirties, forties, fifties, things were made to last. They built yeah. them tough. Now they're made to be thrown away. It's, it's cheaper to go out and buy one and throw the other one in the garbage, right? Well, that seems awfully wasteful. Oh, it is. It's, it's planned obsolescence though. They've, they've done that intentionally. You know, the first light bulb that Edison made is still lit. And the company was like, yeah, I heard the that. company's like, we're not selling any light bulbs because these things don't go bad. So they started, they yeah. started making it to where these things, you know, after so many hours or whatever, it would fail intentionally. That's yeah. the tricky secret behind warranties too. They know that that product's going to take a shit in, you know, six years. So they give you a five year warranty on it, you know, for a lot of things or like, you know, it's, it's going to take a shit in, <laughs> in 20. And I mean, they've got it down to the month. So it's like, this thing's going to take a shit in 25 months. We're going to hook you up with a 24 month warranty, buddy. And you're like, oh man, I got two yeah. years. If anything goes wrong, I can swap it out. And everything's good up until that 25th month. And then all of a sudden, yeah. wah, wah, wah. Mm-hmm. now you got to buy another one. Because yeah, a lot of this shit anymore, you can't fix. Yeah, they've made it so you can't fix it. It's absolutely right. And uh, I, I don't know why I had this thought, but like everyone's like kind of, mad at the kids or the old heads get frustrated with the guys coming up because they don't know how to do anything. Well, we took the tools out of their hands. I think for myself, even my little brother compared, and we're seven years apart. I learned, um, you know, how to use hand tools. I was in the garage. I, I knew how to use a hammer. I knew how to use a drill. My dad was a welder for a while and I learned how to do some oxyacetylene. My little brother, didn't learn how to do any of those things. So when it comes time for him to fix the door in his house because it doesn't work, well, he doesn't know how, right? So we get mad at the young generation, but we're the ones that are supposed to be helping them. If no one's teaching them, they'll never get anywhere and we'll just keep getting more and more frustrated. Yeah, that's true. I never thought of that that way. That's I always get my kid out there because I'll fix stuff around the house. I'll fix it until like I can't fix things anymore. And then I'll just go out and buy new. Same. Like, um, we had, we bought a brand new washer and dryer set and like six months into it, you know, like these two little, I don't know if you've ever had your washer take it apart, but it just starts like oh, rocking yeah. really <laughs> heavily. Well, there's these two long springs that you would think that that's not, that can't be the problem, but that's exactly the problem. So I had my son out there. I was like, come on, we're going to go fix some shit. And like, I had him out there. I was like, here, hold this, twist this, you know, just to get him experience yeah. and exposure. Cause he really doesn't have a whole lot of interest in welding, but I'm like, you're going to learn how to fix some shit around the house. Same thing with my refrigerator. Like yep. I swap the filter out the same way I do every single time. And all of a sudden, you know, like one of the valves got closed and broke because it's like this chintzy cheap plastic. So I pulled this housing out and I'm trying to fix it. And like, you know, I, I, I hit up a uh, YouTube university and I was like, Oh, I got this. I start taking things apart and sure as shit. There's a the one part in there that probably costs about four cents. Well, they don't sell that. So that, that was the only part that I needed and I could have fixed the entire thing. No, I had to spend $150 on this water filter housing to get that tiny little part. I was like, that's, that's some bullshit. Oh, yeah. I'm, it was, if they would have just built it out of some thicker plastic, we w- I wouldn't be here right now, but no, they, they didn't because there's no money in that. That's right. Yeah. I'm the same way. I've had uh, my washer and dryer part three, four times. I actually like put it on my story. I've made videos like it's not welding related, but like you can do it. You absolutely can do it. I just went through it with my dishwasher. I fixed my dishwasher like three times and now, okay, the heating elements screwed up in it. Unfortunately, this model, it's all one big piece. It's going to cost me $600 for this one piece. What's a new dishwasher? Thousand bucks with that warranty. Yeah. So it was time. I, I had to replace the dishwasher and I made a video, haven't edited it. There's no time. Too busy welding. It's yep. a good problem to have though. 
Yeah, it's true. Yeah, I I always say this. I'd I'd rather be busy than have nothing to do. It's whenever the shop is slow, it's the worst. Like you can't stop watching the clock, and I just want to keep my mind busy. I want to stay challenged. If ever I get you know onto a project and I'm in there, like two hours could go by in thirty seconds. Like oh my god, we're not done yet. If I've got nothing to do, that two hours drags on like it's two mm-hmm. weeks. That's that's the hardest thing that I have to deal with is downtime. I freaking I hate downtime. Most people are like, oh no, I need time to like relax and you know, like that's usually right around like two weeks before Thanksgiving and two weeks after Christmas. Like I love that time of the year because I don't have a whole lot going on, but it's probably the worst time uh, out of my year. Just because I don't have yeah. anything going on. And usually, you know, the other eleven months out of the year. I'm a hundred miles an hour. So to, to, to go from a hundred to zero and like have no obligations, nothing to do. No, there's nothing pressing. Everybody's kind of, everybody else is taking vacation and time off. So now I have to suffer with nothing to do. <laughs> it drives me up a freaking wall. <laughs> and that's when you have a, a two bourbons instead of one, right? <laughs> or three or four. Yeah. It's ex- exactly. <laughs> yeah. I know. I know the feeling. Yeah. It's weird. I, I guess like, as welders, whenever you're under the lid, like your mind just talks to itself. You're thinking about weird things or singing songs mm-hmm. or whatever. But now you don't have a welding lid on and you're sitting at home. Like, what are you thinking about? It gets weird. Yep. You should probably just go to the garage and rip some coupons. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there, I mean there's, yeah. there's been times I've done that. Yeah. No, I, I, I keep telling myself, like, I got to get back into my art. I haven't made anything in a, in quite some time. And then every time I go in the garage, it's a horde. Like, so it's a challenge. Like, I've got so much scrap, so much random stuff that, like, I'll use it one day. And <laughs> then, it, like, oh, it becomes a thing where I have to clean out the whole garage before I can even weld something. It gets frustrating. It's like, ah. But, like, this year, I got to make it a priority. I have to. Um, it's it's one of my passions, one of my joys. So, it's yeah. I'm I'm glad I'm not the only one because I'm like oh yeah I'll, I'll I'm gonna hold on to this piece because I know I'm gonna use that I'm gonna need that and as soon as you throw the shit away, like after the trash goes out after it gets picked up that's when you need it. So like I'll hold on to stuff, but yeah. then like you, I want to go out and do something, but fuck I, I gotta go clean and organize the garage and like that's gonna turn into a whole deal and it's like fuck it I'm gonna have a drink. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Man, that's uh, that's like looking into a mirror. Whoops! <laughs> <laughs> but it happens. Though. I mean, I I don't know. It's 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 different. Yeah, and there's like there's a lot of guys that I follow, which I really respect, um, that are just nonstop. Like it's 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 go 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 constantly, right? And like it takes some mental fortitude to be going nonstop all the time. But yeah, I think I think that's what we need. So, like, because I've talked to a lot of welders, and most of them seem to have either like ADD or ADHD or some sort of um, dyslexia. So, I, I maybe those are other common traits. Is the the way that we function? We just gotta constantly stay busy and constantly stay moving. I think so, and I don't want I don't want to generalize, but I think there's two different breeds, right? There are those people that are more than happy to weld the same thing every day like be a production line welder is is like the tops they're more than happy to do that and then there's the other side which can't sit still can't learn enough can't get good enough and yeah it's it's i agree with you there's something there's something wrong with us but it's it's kind of right you know and there's there's a company here well there's a couple companies here in central florida that all specifically like when i was instructing i would send specific students to those companies because i knew that they would do well. So a lot of them, it's, you're, you're just a bench welder production parts, you know, like you've got a cart sitting next to you. You got your own little table, your machine set up, like nothing changes. You pick up the part, you weld it out, you put it on a different cart and you do that all day, every day, 40 hours a week, usually no overtime. And I could, I could identify the people that would do really well there. But then there's the other ones, and I'm like, nope. You need to get into you need to get into ironwork. You need to get into a job shop. You need to get into pipe fitting. You need to get in something that's going to constantly change and challenge your mind eight ten hours out of the day. Because if you sit in that booth over there at that one company, you're gonna you're gonna drive yourself up a freaking wall. Yeah. There's uh yeah it's I mean 
there's there's guys at my shop even and I'm sorry I keep saying guys you know I, I want to be inclusive but I we don't have any ladies yet but you know they'll be in the corner for not even two hours welding the same thing and I can see the frustration building <laughs> it's just the motivation's not there so that's that's the person that would rather be you know on a repair job figure out how it works and fix yep. it and then there's other people that you know they could be on something for three weeks straight and that's awesome. That's that makes them so happy. That's, I think that's the, my favorite or favorite part of welding is the troubleshooting. I like it when things go wrong and we've got to come up with a solution. Yeah, it's entertaining. It's yeah, I I I don't want to say I love that too because you don't want things to go wrong all the time. Right. But yes, absolutely. No, but I mean that that's the fun part because like when things don't go according to plan, it's like okay, cool. Let's let's figure this out. Now we got to involve some critical thinking, especially like if a piece of equipment goes down. I, and I don't love that because now the equipment's down, but mm-hmm. that gives me an opportunity. To, oh, what's this do? You know, get in there and start figuring things out or troubleshooting or, you know, save the day. You know, you get in there and you're like, oh, yeah, I know. Especially, you know, like you, you've been at the same company for 18 years. You know, those machines inside and out and be like, oh, yeah, you got to, you know, yeah. smack the back of this, you know, flip the door up and close it really hard. And, you know, it'll fire right back up. <laughs> you know, it's like, kind of like, uh, what was it, Fonzie with Happy Days? Like, I think you're old enough to remember, like, reruns of Fonzie. <laughs> Walking there, just I do. I bump think, the jukebox. I think it's, yeah. Um, yeah. I, I was living in French when that show was on. So <laughs> maybe not. Um, you're absolutely right, though. Um, you know, I missed a day of work last week and somebody accidentally backed up into the back of the shear. So about a year ago, we had something go wrong with the shear where the same thing happened. This part broke. It was the encoder in the back, which literally counts how many turns of the ball screw, blah, 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 won't bore you. But this piece wrecked. And literally, I couldn't get in touch with anybody because this piece of equipment uh, no longer is being sold in Canada. And I literally, I called whoever I could, reached out on Instagram. Finally, I found a company that knew a guy that knew a guy got a phone number and he walked me through the whole thing. So I missed a day of work and this piece got backed into and it got bent over a little bit. Nobody at the shop knew what to do. The shear was down that whole day. I come in there yeah, Give me five minutes. I'll get her running again. Right. So it's just one of those things. If, if nothing ever goes wrong, you'll never know how to fix the problem. So it's nice when, Hopefully it's not catastrophic, yeah. but it's cool when something goes down and you can really walk in there and save it. the day. On this, uh, yeah, on the same thing with uh, with our press break, we've got an Acura press, and I literally got a crash course when it got installed, and this was many years ago, seven eight years ago, and that's the only time that I learned how to run it or how to program it. It was up to me to learn it to actually get into it. We had during COVID. I can share this now because it's not so secretive. Uh, We were making hospital beds for temporary hospitals. So all these pieces were bent. There was no welding involved. So it took a lot of programming to actually get this one piece that had 18 bends in it to run on the same program. And it just took me sitting there for a good hour or two, plugging it in and using, you know, position breaks instead of easy programming and all this stuff. Would have never had that opportunity if that never came up. And, you know, I'm not afraid to to get in there and do it. As long as you don't lie to the machine, it won't wreck itself. Mm-hmm. No, very cool. Yeah, I've never messed around with, like, complex bends. I mean, it's usually a couple of 90s here and there. But, like, well, yeah, I mean, some of that handrail that we did when I was out of Disney, that got pretty complex, you know, because the way that the Q, Q line runs and stuff like that. But, like, we never had to meet everything back together because you were saying there was no no welds everything would just kind of fits and forms together that'd, yeah, be, that'd be fun to play with yeah exactly it was it was super cool we we teamed up with a company in town that does um you know laser cutting so they would do the cutting we would do the bending and we were just trying to do this as quickly and as accurately as possible but you probably learned it like a shit ton while you're doing that tons tons and now like i'm comfortable getting in there and changing the parameters and and really playing with it. And, you know, not everybody at the shop can do that. I, and if I'm trying to train somebody, like I got to sit down for eight hours before I even train you because I got to, I got to catch up here. I got to relearn the machine. Yep. Um, but it's cool though. Cause again, we're tying back to, to social media. I can reach out to these people that are 
way better than me at doing this stuff. I can even reach out to the manufacturer. Hey, like, do you have any resources? And usually you get an answer within 24 hours. You get an email or you get a phone number or you get a link online. It's, it's pretty sweet. Yeah, that's the cool part about I social suggest- media. You can, you can video it or photo it and send it right there in the DM. Yeah, I always suggest to people, and I get frustrated at some of the some of the people I work with. Like, I get made fun of, like, "Oh, look at that influencer over there." But honestly, the 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 moment that I got onto Instagram and focused on welding was the moment that I started growing and getting better. And I actually thank a lot of the people that I learned off of on Instagram for like progressing my skills and my career. I would have been sitting in the corner just doing the same thing over and over again, but. When I needed to learn how to TIG weld, guess what? Instagram. When I needed to learn how to do, you know, pipe better, how to fit pipe better, Instagram. It's 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 wild. There's a wealth of knowledge on there. Like I never knew that welds could look that good until I got like the, I mean, especially with TIG welding, because I've always just done you know like regular stringers and stuff like that. And you get on and you start seeing you know weld porn or the stuff that you know Dabs does or the stuff that Rush Kane's doing. And you're like, holy shit! Like that's possible with this equipment like i had no idea i think yeah, I, did. I didn't get on instagram to like 2016 somewhere around in there and it was like damn like there's people that are like really good at this yeah yeah way better than you oh yeah <laughs> yeah and it's cool too because half the time like they're sharing their settings either in the in the uh caption or like right on the screen Oh, I've got 50% background, blah, blah, blah. It's, it's all right there. So you get to go back and try it either at your shop or like with the price of machines these days, like you're, you're stupid not to buy yourself something and and start doing it at home. Right. Yeah. You can get a good setup for under a thousand bucks. Yeah. Actually, some guy brought, uh, he doesn't know how to run it, but he brought his little Amazon welder to the shop. And his purpose for showing up at the shop was for us to figure out how to run it. And then he would come in and learn from us how to run it. <laughs> but he paid 200 bucks for this thing. 200 bucks comes with a stinger, comes with a ground, comes with a TIG torch, set of consumables under 200 bucks. Like, you're ridiculous not to. Yeah. I think Matt, uh, I think it was I'm pretty Matt sure. Arnold. Yeah, he brought it. Had like, he's got like this little, I think it was Matt. He bought this little welder off Amazon. It's smaller than a freaking toaster. But he's like, well, mm-hmm. he's 70, 18, eighth inch diameter rods with it. It's like this little yep. tiny, you know, about the size of a box of Pop Tarts. It's freaking nuts. Yeah. It's crazy. It's crazy, the technology. And it, it's only getting better. Things are getting more affordable. You know, like I think my next venture, I, w- I really want to get into uh, more of the laser welding. I want to try that system out. I want to do some testing with yeah. it and then like probably get one at Underground Metalworks. Yeah, I I want to try one too. I haven't been able to see one in real life yet. And I remember like not even three years ago, like this this first laser welder came out or the video came out and it's just like, oh, undercut, lack of penetration. Like this is stupid. It, it takes zero skill to weld with it. And now here we are and it's like real. The technology is real. You can buy these things. You can put them in your shop and just going back to stainless, like try to put a stainless joint as fast as as this, uh, as this laser welder does without putting in all the heat you can yeah and like once you get done i guess the plates are like warm it's not super hot but it's like warm um but yeah i actually had one of the females that just came we had we did a weekend welding class for this uh, group of ladies called sisters on the fly and she bought this laser welder for like i think she said she paid like 15 grand and it came over on a slow boat from china but she bought it through amazon but she can, she can, uh, depending on the tip that she puts on there, she can remove rust up to like, I think six inch wide swaths, you know, so you can take off rust, yeah. paint, all this other stuff, uh, except for blue paint. Apparently there's something with the UV spectrum and then, um, she can, so she can like do the, uh, it's so it's, n- it's yeah, it's not a conspiracy then. I, yeah, I guess not. Paint your roof blue. Paint your roof blue. And then, <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, but she can also cut with it. So she can put a different attachment on there and cut like aluminum, stainless steel, you know, with a laser. And then I, but there's this backing or whatever that you have to put behind it. So it doesn't overshoot. And then, uh, she can also switch, you know, put a different head attachment on there with like a little, um, spool of wire or whatever. And she can essentially MIG weld with a laser. 
uh, both of the prongs have to touch the material at the same time. And you just pull the trigger and you just weld right across. She's, she said, it's warm, but it's not hot. So it's, it's great because she does, um, what the hell? She repairs old uh, Volkswagen buses. And so she's been using that to do oh, like, cool. you know, put in new panels and stuff like cut old stuff out, remove rust. So she says it's freaking cool. So I think she's going to bring it by the school one day. But it'd be I want to I want to see it. That's it's pretty great, dope. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen a few videos on that, even just getting it for the rust removal aspect, mm-hmm. like one one swath. And there you go. You've prepped your material. Yep. That, that, that takes and then the safety factor, too, because now you're not playing around with the grinder. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cause you're putting all that stuff in, in the air. You might get a wire in the eye. Like we talked about. Yeah. yeah all you got to wear is like the little red shades or whatever the IR shades, and then you're good to go. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. It's, it's the, it's the wave of the future. I guess. Yeah. Good time to be alive. You get to see a lot of this new, yeah. cool, crazy it's, technology and adapt it, you know, cause yeah. the, the generation before us, they didn't want to adopt any of this technology, but I think we're, we kind of grew up on that age of like, the internet was invented when we were in like middle school, you know? So we've got like, we're, we yeah, fall right in between the analog and the digital age. Yeah. It's hard to tell people that like, especially, uh, you know, I've got a nephew who's just graduating this year and it's, Hey man, when I was your age and I hate <laughs> saying that, geez, I'm old. Um, but like, we didn't, we didn't have cell phones and that blew his mind. Like the internet came around exactly like middle school, elementary yeah. school. What's this crazy thing? Like eighties kids, man, we're we're the greatest. It, it came in. We're getting to see everything. CD. <laughs> yeah, AOL yep. online. <laughs> You've got mail. Yuck, that's crazy. I remember downloading a picture of Pamela Anderson, and it took about six hours. Me and my buddy were in in, in the basement on his dad's computer, and it took about six hours, <laughs> and we finally saw Pamela Anderson. That was that was crazy. And now you have everything available to you. The OnlyFans generation. Hey, like, yeah, it's right there on your cell phone. There you go. Boom, done. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. so I got a quick question for you before we get out of here. How does it feel to know that you were born in the late 1900s? <laughs> I feel distinguished. It, it hits I'm different a distinguished when you say it like that, gentleman. doesn't it? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I was born in the late 1900s. Oh, uh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. 2003 was still like two, three years. That's ago, what I keep yeah. thinking. They're like, oh yeah, back in 03. Yeah, I'm like, oh yeah, that was a couple of years ago. Nope, that was 20 years ago. <laughs> nope. I always say like, you get to a certain point and it's different for people, but you know, 25, you're, you're figuring your life out. You're doing this. I think, and especially for guys, I think that's where we peak, uh, you know, mentally, uh, it, especially, you know, uh, I, humor levels, maybe like we never get out of that, you know, balls are still funny uh-huh. and, you know, poop jokes are still funny. So like your body ages, but you're still who you were back when you were 25. I feel that myself, I guess. Yeah. I don't think guys grow up mentally after the age of 25. That sounds about right. Yeah. Yeah. So you figure out who you are and that's, that's who you are. And hopefully you take care of your body and you can keep being 25 for the rest of your life. Yeah. That's the goal. <laughs> well shit before we get out of here kevin why don't you tell everybody uh where they can find you um i keep it pretty simple you can find me on instagram i'm kevin r 306 uh you can find me on the cwb association youtube there's a link in my bio if you just hit the welding tips uh that's where my videos are for that um you can stay tuned i've got some more videos planned this year um and i'm gonna be hitting up uh, Skills Canada, which is in my uh, home province of Quebec here, coming up this summer. And um, hopefully, if I play my cards right, check out Canwild Fabtech um, here in Toronto right away. So I'm uh, hoping to take a, take advantage of all these opportunities. Yeah, there should be a lot of good. But anytime, out. reach out. Oh, yeah. Reach out in the DMs. Like, I'm here to help people. I'm here to build the community. So don't be afraid. Awesome, brother. Once again, it was great chatting with you. Good catching up with you. I know it's uh, been since October that we got to chat last. Maybe uh, yeah. maybe I can get up to FabTech Canada, or you can come down here for uh, FabTech in USA and down here in uh, beautiful, sunny Orlando, I, Florida. I hope so. I hope so. I have to hit up Max. 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it, you're going to need to cut your budget, and put a little bit in my budget, and let's uh, let's make this thing happen. <laughs> let's do a Disney World trip. We'll we'll hit up Jason while we're down. There you there. go. Come on down, man. <laughs> All right, brother. Well, thank you for having me. Appreciate you. Oh, anytime, man. All right, ladies and gents, thanks so much for tuning into the show. I hope you all enjoyed the conversation between Kevin and I. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite downloader app if you haven't done so already, and leave a review if you're joint if you're enjoying the content. I hope you all have a great rest of your week. Stay safe out there, and until next time, make every world better than your last. <laughs>